like him and serve him and love him and do all that God's called us to do. So good morning. Praise the Lord for this great Lord's Day. Uh, there was an outer towner. He was driving his car up in the country and he made a sharp turn. It was wet that day, a little dew on the ground and sure enough, this little city slicker put his car right in the ditch. Well, one good thing, there was an old farmer plowing with his old plow horse right near the fence where he went in. So that old farmer walked over and made sure the man was okay and said, hey, uh, I'll help you pull out of the ditch. He said, well, I guess I'll call a wrecker. He said, no, no, Buddy, my plow horse, he, he, he can pull you out. So he hooked old Buddy up to the car and then the man began to say this. He said, pull, Buster, pull. Pull, Nelly, pull. Pull, Concho, pull. Buddy's still not doing anything. And then he hollered, pull, buddy, pull, and boom, right out the ditch. Car gets pulled out. The man thanked him for pulling him out of the ditch, but he said, I'm just concerned. He said, you, you called your horse the wrong name the first three times. Uh, why'd you do that? He said, you, you gotta understand, buddy's blind, and if he thought he was the only one pulling, he wouldn't even tried. You know, some of us are in situations, maybe even this morning, that uh, you don't even feel like trying anymore. Whether it's a besetting sin, a financial situation, a health situation, a relationship situation, whatever the case may be, you just haven't uh, found success in your situation. I've called it situation because that covers just about everything whether it's financial or a decision or anything else you're facing, God wants you to find success, not in the world's definition of success, but really spiritual success in that situation that you're facing this morning. And we're gonna be looking at the, the life of Abraham and seeing the situations God put him in. Of course, he was really Abram during part of this because God hadn't changed his name and to see how we can relate to that. And really there's four points that we all need to remember. We've kind of put them with all starting with the same letter so you can remember maybe even this week as you're going through that situation. To withdraw, to walk, to wait, to watch, and to worship. Anytime you're faced with whatever situation you're in or whatever situation I am, I gotta remember the, the five W's because I'll never really get through that situation make the right decision in the situation unless I reflect back on these five W's. So let's look at them this morning. The first one is withdraw from where you feel you are comfortable. I don't know about you, but I like comfortable. I got one amen. So Rhonda back here and myself like comfortable. And if y'all like to be uncomfortable and in pain, agony, distress, worry, fear, then have at it. But I like comfortable, but God many times sends me to uncomfortable uh, or routine. I like routine for things not to change, but God seems like he likes change. You know, things change all the time. You know, right when you think you got it all repaired, it breaks. Right when you think you got the finances go, something messes up. Right when you think you're okay, then you got a catastrophe coming. It seems like there's always change and God's kind of into that withdrawal, getting us out of that comfort zone. I entitled this the leaving situation because God goes to Abraham and says, now the Lord said to Abram, go forth, go. Well, I don't want to leave. God tells him what to leave. He said, I want you to go forth from your country. I want you to go forth from your relatives. I want you to go forth from your father's house. Where? Anything in particular, Lord, to the land which I will show you. You ever find out you don't get all the facts from the Lord? When you're going through what it is you're going through, God doesn't seem to reveal everything. But he does tell us, if we'll listen, he is telling us instruction in our situation. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is I'm going through, God is giving me. You say, well, I don't know what it is. Well, just do what he's telling you now. And all Abraham had to go on was two words, really one, go. Where? Go. 
To where? Go. When? Now. <laughs> that was about the only answer he had. Go now. Yeah, but Lord, I like my relatives. And I like my country. I like this job. And I like this area. And I like this house. I think I'll stay here. How many people have done that to God when God truly led them to do something different in their situation and they just went with the comfortable, they went with whatever they've been doing the last, however many they've been doing it, years, the same old way. And that Abraham, I think, was quite comfortable where he was. And then we see that in this same situation, God is making, the making comes before the blessing. He goes on to say, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. I don't know about you, but I like the blessing. You like the blessing? I like the blessings. But when God's order of things, he always puts the making before the blessing. See, God's more interested in making me than blessing me. Did you catch that? God's more interested in making me than blessing me. That's why the makes before the bless. But we miss when we go through a situation. We say, God bless. Bless my health, bless my finances, bless my situation. Get me out of this, change this, remedy this. God said, let's make first. Let's do some making before we do some blessing. God wants to change it. And you know, of course, our prayer is always could be this. Lord, either change the situation or change me. That's about the only two things we have as option. If God's not going to change the situation, then change me to adopt to this situation that's going to be the way it is. And maybe it will never change, but you can change me, Lord, to where I can handle this situation, whatever it is, and uh, make that adjustment, Lord. We all have flaws. We all have weaknesses. We all have issues that are more pertinent to us maybe than to other people that we have to deal with. You know, and none of us are exempt. Man, man I, I thought I had some attacks from Satan. Then I became a pastor and thought, well, I guess I'll be exempt here. Lord's allowed me to be, man, it was double bullseye. You know, there's some stuff I never experienced before that were attacks from the enemy. So we're, none of us are going to be exempt at any stage of our life. And then he indicates to Abraham in verse 2 that the giving always comes after the blessing. And so you shall be a blessing, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. You have to excuse me, I'm taking this new medicine and it keeps me dry. You see, a lot of times people forget that once the blessing comes, we're to be a blessor. God lays it out for Abraham. Okay, I'm, I'm going to make you. Once I make you, I'm going to bless you. But once I bless you, you got to be a blessor. Because through you, you will be a blessing in all the families of the world to be blessed. Because I want to do blessings through people. Did you bless anybody this week? And you know, I began to think, Lord, I wonder why my blessings hadn't come. God said, what would you do with your last blessing? I got blessed. What'd you do with it to bless somebody else? I smiled at him and told him, I got blessed. I said, no, but what did you do with your blessing? I said, well, he may be telling me, you, why'd I give you any more blessings? You hadn't blessed with your last blessing. You hadn't become a blasor, blessor. You may have been a blastor, but you hadn't become a blessor with your last blessing. See, this is, this is God's way that God deals with things. We don't question God. God says, this is how you work. I got to either get in your plan or do my own plan. But if I'm going to get in your plan, this is how your plan works. And then, of course, when we do things God's way, he always uses it for favor. Hey, I'll bless you, bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I'll curse. See, I know that people that help and minister and bless me, God's going to bless those people. See, when you bless God's children, God blesses you. I don't know, there's probably no greater thing that somebody could do for you than bless your children. 
And there's probably nothing that could rile your feathers up more than do something bad to your children. That mama bear going to come out. That papa bear going to come out. Why? Because we love our children. God's the same way. You bless his children. God likes that. He'll bless you for blessing his children. And if somebody's done you wrong, don't worry about getting vengeance. Don't worry about getting even. Don't get mad. God will take care of it. He said, I'll curse those who curse you. I'll take care of it. Just leave it alone and do what I say. And so now we see that he's going to have to trust God and leave. Leave what's comfortable. Leave the way he's always been doing things. Maybe through our last tragedy, God wanted us to change the way we've been doing things. To change the way we've always done things. Because if we don't do anything, we'll spend the next however many years we have on earth just the way we are. Because we've been that way all this time. God's looking for change. He's looking for adoption. He's looking for some things to do. You know, because even in Chronicles, he, he did evil, it says in Chronicles, because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. They were already preset. In Mark, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. See, the following comes, then the making comes. We want God to make us. Well, follow, then I'll make. You know, it says in Psalms, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. God, you're holding back on me. Well, not if you're walking uprightly. So you've left, and now God's blessed. You've withdrawn and started to walk uprightly, and now you're seeing God's blessing on your life and in your situation. Second one is we've got to walk not just withdraw, I'm leaving something. You got to be going somewhere. And I call this the decision situation. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. In verse one, it said go. And in verse four, it said so. If you want to look at why Christians aren't blessed, they know the word go but they hadn't gone to sow. It's okay to know what God wants. It's another thing to do it. So if you got go and you don't have sow, God may be saying no. <laughs> Until you say so. See, Abraham could have said, praise God in the Lamb, his word says go. Let's sing a song. Go, 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 go. Well, that's good and fine and dandy. Let's raise our hands and say, God said go. Well, that's good too. Let's pray that God says go. That's fine and dandy. Now let's go. Let's do what God says. And you know, Abraham is 75 years old. That's a time to sit back and enjoy your place you've already built. But he never complains. He never questions. You never see anything that would cause him to even delay this situation. It just, God said go. It's time to pack it up and go. It doesn't say as well that he delayed his answer. We have to understand that delayed obedience is disobedience. If you know God's saying something and you're saying, I'm going to wait, that's disobedience. If you don't believe that, tell your child to clean their room and they say, I'll do it when I get around to it. And if you're okay with that response, then you're okay with God being that way. But that's not how God is and that's not how you are as a parent. If you say, clean this room right now, you mean clean the room right now. And delayed obedience is disobedience in the same way with Abraham. He just was told to go and he went without delay. He said, how do you know where to go? That's a good question. God didn't tell him where to go. See, when God gives me a command, I don't know what's down the road. And if I'm waiting to get all the answers of what obedience means down there, I'll probably never get it. But God will give me enough illumination for me to make the first step. The word is a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. It didn't say a torch, a Q-beam, a spotlight. It's a lamp. Therefore, if I take one step in obedience, 
Guess what that torch, and guess what that lamp does? It gives me one more step worth of light. So he went, and God gave him illumination. You just keep going, and God will keep giving you one step illumination. Not the big picture. You say, what if, and what that, and what if that happens, and what if that happens, and what if that? That's not walking by faith. It's saying, God said this, so I'm going to take the first step, and God will give me the next step. You say, but wasn't this going to cost him some inconvenience? Yeah. Packing all that stuff up, lugging it, temporary dwelling in your tent when you had probably a very nice home. Now you're going to have to just be living on the road. All these inconveniences. I like what Dr. George Morrison said, the great Scottish preacher. He said, the important thing is not what we live in, but what we live for. That's what makes a person, not where, what they live in. It's what they live for. That makes all the difference in the world. And of course, he could always came back. And a lot of people do in their Christian life. They leave and they go back to li living the way they always did. And we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to keep going forward. You know, the third one is, wait on God's way of getting you there. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, okay, I know what God wants, but I'm going to do it my way. See, that's where a lot of Christianity conflict comes in. The person says, here's what God wants. Okay, I understand that. Here's what it's going to cost me. I understand that. But I want to do it my way on my timetable and making my decisions on how to get there. Not. That's just as bad as not doing it at, at all. If you don't believe me, look at some of these illustrations in the life of Abraham. First, I call it she's my sister situation. Of course, you all know that that's kind of a half truth, but she was his wife primary. So this little trying to say it's a white lie doesn't really cover because he had to come up with some excuse. You see, what happened was he was getting near Egypt. And he tells his wife, please say that you're my sister. I'm sure she's saying, why on earth would you want me to do that? Well, it, it says here, so that it'll go well with me. Oh, it's all about you, huh, Abraham? You better believe it. I want it all to go well with me. Well, what about with Sarah? Buddy, you're putting her in danger. You're putting her in a bad situation here. Why did he do that? Well, she was very, very beautiful. And so he felt like if I'm going to go through Egypt, those pharaohs, they got harems. And she sure would look good in one of those harems. And if they find out I'm her husband, now she's a free woman. It's kind of where his brain was thinking. Do you ever do that when you want to obey God? Let's see if I do this, if I do that, if I do that. I may not get this. I may get fired. I may... May lose my retirement. I may may not have the house. Uh, no, 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 no. None of you do that. You don't kind of figure out the whole line up. So Abraham did like we did. He thought it through. He said, "God, I know you are a great, mighty God, and you can protect me in all this. But let me go ahead and do this little line right now, because I want to get there. But I want to do it my way. And if I tell the truth, I'm gonna die." No, you just trust God. Do it the way God said to do it. And so he lied. And we don't have time to see this, look at the catastrophe and the havoc that this lie brought. He said, well, at least he learned his lesson. Well, no, because now in Gehar, in Genesis 20, Abraham said of Sarah, she's my sister. And it's the same deal. Another catastrophe, another havoc that occurred. Praise God, God got him out of it. But we always have to wait and do it God's way and not our way. Whatever your situation is, if you're thinking it through and you're getting it logical and you're cranking it out, that, that's not how God works. It's not always logical. Many times it's not logical. Many times it's, many times it's anti-logical. It just doesn't make sense. And then there's the made situation. You know, they can't have a baby. God's promised them a baby and they keep waiting for this baby and waiting for this baby and waiting for this baby. So let's come up with a different plan. 
And Sarah said to Abram, now behold, the Lord has prevented me. Don't you, don't you like it when things go bad, the Lord always gets blamed? That's the first thing. That's the Lord. He's prevented. You ever watch the news, you know, you, God does five million great things. The news never says anything. Then the storm comes. It's an act of God that these people were killed. You know, it's just, God gets blamed for it all. And here we have it as well. So let's do another, another way. Let's do it our way, Abram. Please go to my maid. Perhaps I can obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. I think the Bible puts that in there so that we'll know he didn't listen to the voice of God. You'll always have people around you that's going to give you some counsel. And some people look for the counsel that's not God so that it'll subdue their conscience to say, well, sister such and such said and brother such and such said, and I'm not saying don't go to people for counsel. That's always, it's wise, but if the counsel is not what the God said, then you're still not off the hook and it's still going to go south. And boy, did this one go south. If you don't believe it at south, tune into the, radio, the news and see what's happening in the Middle East. That came from this event. These two brothers, Ishmael and Isaac, you got your Middle East problem. So this thing's still going on. Why? Because one man decided to do God's will his way. Well, he wants us to have children. He told us he'd give us children. And we're not having children. So I don't think he kept part of his promise, so we'll get children our way. Mm -mm. That comes up with another problem. Do you see how our problems, go back and look at you. You know, do a timeline on your problems, a lot of our problems. It's when we did things our way and not God's way. And we thought they'd turn out the best, but they turned out the worst. That doesn't mean God's not a God of grace. Look what he did here with Abraham. Abraham did turn toward God. Do you know what the prodigal did wrong? It wasn't that he, it wasn't the inheritance that got him in trouble. It's getting the inheritance his way. He was always going to get the inheritance. He was always going to get the blessing. But when he got the inheritance his way, it led to the pig pen. If he had awaited and got the inheritance the father's way, he had to live the rest of his life in luxury because he had got all that inheritance. They end up squandering it and got zero. And then the end of his life, he had no inheritance. So the problem was not the inheritance. He wanted the inheritance his way. Say, Brother Tim, it's going to be different for me. I know how to make myself happy. And I don't have to live God's way on every situation. Well, God has a verse for us on that one too. Let God be true, though every man be found a liar. I don't know about you, but I've never found God to be a liar on anything. And I've never found God to be wrong on any situation. Never. On any person's situation that came to me and said, Brother Tim, I did it all the way the Bible said not to do it and it all worked out just perfect. Never had anybody, I've never seen that. But people feel like they still can't trust God when he's 100% right on 100% of the things. But I've had plenty of people say, Brother Tim, man, I didn't do what the Bible said on this and now help me get through this. What do I do to, get un to correct this and this has turned out terrible and I don't know what to get out of this mess because we do it our way instead of God's way. We sing, I waited on the Lord on high and I waited and he heard my cry. <laughs> I waited. Oh, I don't like that word any more than you do. But we got to wait to see God's way instead of our way. You know, back in the old west when they had a, the old general stores, the children back in the old west would love to go in to town and one mother took their eight-year-old son into town and the general store owner was a big man henry and he was he was about six foot six 280 big man and so they went into this uh um, store and the owner saw the little boy and little johnny and said johnny I, I, here's it he brought out the jar of candy which was how they did it back then he said look Johnny, just reach in there and get a handful of this candy for free. I just want to do that for you. Well, Johnny wouldn't reach out. 
And he asked him, no, reach out, it's free. I'm going to give it to you. Take a handful of candy. Well, Johnny wouldn't reach out. And so his mother said, Johnny, reach in there. Uh, Mr. Henry is giving you that for free. Go ahead. And he wouldn't do it. So the owner took his hand and got a handful and put it in the bag and rolled it up, handed it to little Johnny, and they went home. And as they went home, the mom asked little Johnny, said, well, why wouldn't you do what Mr. Henry asked you to do and reach in there and get a handful of candy? And, you know, why did you do that? Johnny looked over his mom and said, his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> See, Johnny wasn't so dumb after all. Big old Mr. Henry with those big old hands. He got about 10 times more candy home than he would if he had reached in that bag. See, God's hands are big too. And if you don't, and I don't believe that God's way through my situation will get me more candy, then reaching in that bag with my hand will, and we don't trust a big God. God always brings me his big handfuls. If I do it his way, his hands are big. He can take care of this situation. He can come through his way. Because he's got bigger hands. But we're too quick to grab them. Oh, I got it. And our little hands just get that. But we trust the hands of God to come through in a bigger and a better way than we could ever hope to get on our own. But it takes faith to do it God's way. And Abraham and Sarah in these situations didn't. But by the grace of God in their life and by the grace of God in our life, God gives us another opportunity. Let's get this right. Let's don't do it the same way we've always been doing it. Let's do it a different way. Let's do it God's way. And then the next one is watch. Watch to see God's blessings. Then the Lord took note of Sarah. Please note that God took note of your situation. He took note. Of Sarah. He knew she was barren. He knew what was going on. A lot of times, God, don't you see what I'm going through? Hey, the Lord took note. God knows what Sarah was going through. And God took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what? As he had promised. We can bank on his promise. We just hadn't waited long enough. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, when? At the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. See, if my answers haven't come, I need to wait a little longer for God's appointed time. Don't jump in front of God. Don't go around God. Wait on God. He'll bring you the best at the right appointed time. See, you know what my appointed time is? Now. Not tomorrow, not next week. My appointed time is always now. But I found out that God's timing is not always now. Very seldom now. Very few times in my life have been now. I praise the Lord for the nows when he gives it me an answer immediately or in a week. But I found out that most of my Answers have come at an appointed time that seems to be down the road too far. But it wasn't too far. It was right when it needed to happen for it to happen. You know, don't be like the guy that asked his friend, you know, about, you know, what's going on with your life. And the guy said, hey, with my luck, when my ship comes in, I'll be at the airport. <laughs> you know, if God sends your ship in, don't be at the airport. Be at the shipyard. Be where God wants to send your ship. And don't miss the appointed time and the appointed place. And then the last point is worship. Worship. Why? Because of God's goodness. Call it the sacrifice your son situation. Now Abraham and Sarah have a son. The son that they've waited on all their life the son of promise, the son that God promised them from the beginning that they would have. Now they have it. Now he's a boy and they're enjoying the blessings of God. And then you know that God 
asked Abraham to take his son, his only son, and to sacrifice him. Wow, man, what a, what a request to be named, made known of somebody that this is all part of our situations. We have to withdraw. We have to keep walking. We have to wait. We watch. But we have to worship. And worship is sacrifice. And that God may call us at times to sacrifice something that we'd rather not do. Well, Brother Tim, here's what I really want to do, so it must be God. I don't know where we got that. I may really want to murder. <laughs> may really want to steal something. I mean, just because I want to do it doesn't make it from God. And I, this is the very thing that Abraham would have not wanted to do, was to sacrifice his only son. But that's what he was called, and look what Abraham calls it. Abraham's getting ready to do it. So Abraham said to the young man, stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad, that's his son Isaac, will go over there, where, to make this sacrifice. And we will worship and return to you. You call that worship? Abraham, you're calling that worship. Well, he was also acting on faith because he was saying it will return. How can we return if you're going to sacrifice his son? Abraham was probably thinking, I don't know, but something's going to happen because he made me a promise and he's going to keep it. I don't know if he's going to save me from killing him or if he's going to let me kill him and resurrect him, but he's going to keep his promise and we're going to return. But it's all worship. I like what Josh Riley, how he defined worship. He says this, quote, everything we, about worship, this is worship. Everything we think, everything we say, everything we do, revealing what we treasure and value most in life. That's worship. So how was he worshiping? What did he treasure most? His son. His son above God? We'll see. We'll see if he treasured anything above God. And when he went up there, obviously he didn't. That was the second most thing he treasured. But he let God or he proved to himself that that didn't even trump God. That God, I love this son more than I love my life, but I don't love him more than you. Now, I've never seen anybody called to do that kind of sacrifice to prove their value and priority of God. But there are things that each of us go through in our life situations that do test if we value or treasure anything before God and the situation will be so that we can worship. A lot of people say, what is worship? You know, I've come across, I guess, one of the best illustrations of, of how to describe worship. And it's the NFL. You see, some people like that kind of worship so much, they come early to the worship service. <laughs> it's called tailgating. And I never heard anybody say, well, I can't come to the service early. I already have to stay through the whole game and you want me to come early for a prayer meeting? Yes. Oh, those guys say, oh, get out of the way. I want to tailgate. I want to do part of this worship service even before the service starts. It's good. There's people that do that. I don't know if you've seen the news. People do show up to those events early to just say, we want more than can be even got there. And and you know, those people even have to pay a lot of money. They don't even let them in that deal free. They have to pay for parking and pay this enormous to sit down. And I've never heard anybody ever complain about that that kept them from going. Worship. And then they go back regularly every Sunday and I've never heard any of them say, their friends say, you're just a fanatic. You old fanatic. They don't call them fanatic. But they go every game. Worship. So you can't keep these people out. They just love it. And, and then they talk about the NFL and football in places outside the sporting event. But Brother Tim, you're only supposed to talk about sports in the sporting event. 
Don't talk about church, uh, sporting goods, sporting events in the workplace or at school. That just would be fanatical. But they do it. And they wear shirts and jerseys and whatever. And guess what? They even get excited. They, they usually don't sit in the event like this. My wife made me come. My husband made me come. My mother made me come. My parents made me come. No, they're just ooh, enjoying that. And they don't have to be forced to come back. Worship! This is a great thing to do. And, and it has all the elements of worship, but it's not really true worship because the only person we can worship is God. But you get the idea. There can be an event where people do that. They can provide that kind of excitement that's generated from within and not from without, but we feel like God's holding us back. If we do do it God's way in our situation, God's gonna hold something back. It's just, I know that's how I felt as a teenager. It's not like, it just can't be as fun and good and great and exciting a life if you do it this church way. I just, that just didn't click with me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. God's holding something back. That didn't take long to prove that wrong. God's not holding anything back. Here's a poem entitled, If Kites Could Talk. Without this string, I could soar, but now I'm kept bound. The truth is, without this string, I'd fall quickly to the ground. The very thing that a kite thinks is not allowing him to go higher and higher and higher because it's holding him back. Once he says, I don't want that binding, I don't want that holding back, clip. We fall, we don't go higher. God's not holding us back in the sense of holding us back. If he has regulations on our life, it's so that we can soar. It's the string that has us bound that is getting up, up, off the, off, up in the air. Not holding us back. Young people, don't fall for that lie. I'll soar higher when God's got his string on me. And it'll keep me from danger and keep me from falling instead of keep me from going higher and higher and higher and higher for him. Will we allow God to be God in our situation? Look at this verse. How great is his goodness, which he has stored up for those who fear him, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. What has God done with his goodness? Stored it up. I don't know about you, if something's under construction in this area, for a while it just seemed like, you know, that's going to be a storage place. That's going to be, I've never seen more storage places pop up in my lifetime than the last 10 years. I mean, we just got a lot of stuff to store, I guess. We just like packing it away. And so storage lots is the great investment of the early 2000s. Looks like God's got some storage lots too. Because this verse says he's storing up that goodness. He's got it in warehouses and all kind of places, wherever God does his storage. What's in those storage lots? Goodness. You say, bring it on, God. Unload those goodnesses. That's probably not a word. On me. Well, if you want the code to the storage lot, there it is right there, those who fear him. That means those that respect and do what he asked them to do. He's, and a lot of people, you know, it's like, man, where's the blessing of God? But sometimes God pours it out at that appointed time. So whatever our situation is that we're going through, if we wait, God does have that goodness stored up. And for some of us, it may be tomorrow. And some may be next month. And some may be a year from now. But we keep waiting on God in our situation because we want to have success in our situation. And God has that for us. Whatever that success is to Him. It's not what the world calls success. Because that success is fleeting. But God's success is meaningful. You could find out that every person in this room is going through a situation. 
of one kind or another. And if you're not, hello to tomorrow. Hello to tomorrow. And if we do these four W's to be ready for every situation, we can see, I believe, some of this storage of goodness that God pours out to them that love him and they take their refuge in him. God, I don't know how to get through this thing, but I want to get through it your way. And if I've been getting through it my way, I'm going to go back to your way because I'm trusting you for worship, for you to come through as only you can. And if I'm doing it the wrong way, Lord, show me the right way because all of us need God. If you'd stand to your feet with every head bowed and every eye closed.